Welcome to the Real Church Podcast. You can learn more about Real Church online at realchurch.today. Now here's today's message. Exodus chapter 32. I'm starting a series this morning that I will preach through the revival night in July. And uh, when Carol and I come back from our Cancun invasion, um, (laughs) uh, we will continue with this series. I want to look at several things throughout this series. We're going to look at several things in the Bible that are going to come together for us and paint a picture of what the last days look like. And uh, it's going to take some time for this to unfold, so you just stay with me, okay? And and know that we are, we're, we're going to learn some things along the way that's going to make me and you stronger Christians. Amen. Have y'all read any stories in the Bible where God's people were not persecuted? Nope. Nope. So I realize that that most time when you talk about Christianity from the viewpoint of the Bible versus what we're seeing in the church today, you end up finding yourself kind of on an island. Like you're hearing messages that don't necessarily agree with what you're going to hear over the next few weeks. But I believe it's Bible. If it wasn't, I wouldn't preach it. And I've entitled this series, The Church Gone Wild. And I got that right out of Scripture. And I'm going to show it to you today. Exodus chapter 3, verse 25. Exodus 32, I'm sorry. Chapter 32. That's what happens when you need glasses and can't get your kids to go help you get them. Because they will not allow me to pick them out by myself. I feel like a two-year-old. <laughs> like this, he just said, "You tell your two-year-old, no, you cannot pick your own clothes. Why not? Because you don't know how to pick them. That's why." Okay, Exodus thirty-two, verse twenty-five. In the King James, it reads this way: Moses saw that Aaron had let the people get completely out of control much to the amusement of their enemies. That is, I said King James, that's the New Living Translation. The the Message Bible says it this way. Moses saw that the people were simply running wild. Aaron had let them run wild, disgracing themselves before their enemies. This is the story that begins in verse number one. It says, when the people saw how long it was taking Moses to come down off the mountain. You remember what happened here is God's people uh, all along the way out of Egypt have been labeled rebellious and stubborn. You know the story probably, how that no matter, it just didn't seem whatever great thing God did, it was never enough to just get them on board to believe. little side note, I want my faith to get to a place that I don't need God to do some bigger thing for me to have faith. How about he just wants us to have faith in him just because he's God, not because he just turns... You know, he stopped the rain or started the rain or moved the mountain or didn't move the mountain or I walked on the water or I didn't. How about we just believe God because he's God? I don't need to see another thing for him to be known as God that created the heavens and the earth and everything's in it. Hallelujah. Come on. (laughs) And so they were labeled that because they just couldn't believe it. It didn't matter what God did. He brought water out of a rock, not just water. You know, I don't know if your picture of that is just a little trickle. When you got a few million people that need water in a desert, God brought a stream out of a rock that, that just kept giving them water. When they needed food, he rained it down out of heaven. Made up a new food for them, manna. 
<laughs> and yet they still, you know, if you, had, if you were there at the parting of the Red Sea, you would think that, you would think that just the parting of the water would have been enough. But then they walked immediately after it parted, they walked across, the Bible says, dry ground. How many of y'all been walking on the bottom of water? It ain't dry at the bottom. It's muddy, wet. And it's, they just walked over dry ground after God parted the Red Sea. That would be enough, but no. Then the enemy came and God said, that's okay, and closed it up and killed them all. They literally stood there and watched that, and yet were still rebellious and stubborn. <laughs> I was thinking, don't don't waste the blessings God puts on your life. Don't 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 discount. Don't forget what God has done. He's done great things. Come on. And uh, and so so God says, here's what I want you to do. He says, I want you to go up. On, I'm gonna just paraphrase this story. He says, Moses, I want you to leave Aaron in charge, and you and Joshua are gonna go up the mountain. But Joshua's only going to go about halfway up, and he's going to stay right there. And then you're going to come on up, and I'm going to meet with you. <laughs> and I'm going to—I want you to bring two tablets with you, two two stone tablets. Bring your engraving tools, and I'm going to—I'm going to give you my law. I'm going to give you my word to take back to the people. But the Bible says that the people rose up and they told Aaron, we don't know what happened to this fellow Moses. <laughs> Some of y'all, I hope y'all never say that about me. I don't know what's wrong with our pastor. I don't know where he's at. I don't know what he's doing. That's kind of what they said. I don't, I don't know what's up with this guy, this fellow. That, that's like a total disdain of the man of God and dishonoring him. What happened to this fellow Moses? <laughs> and uh, who brought us here? Who brought us here to this place? They didn't forget. They just forgot. If you know what I mean. Yeah, he brought them there, but you left out a few details along the way that God has been with this man every step of the way. He's been leading you by a cloud by day and a pillar of fire at night. <laughs> How about that's enough to believe? <laughs> Every night, <laughs> this flame comes up. We follow it. <laughs> we remember, but we forgot. And uh, so Aaron said, this, these scriptures just blow my mind. They, they just blow my mind. Aaron said, Take the golden rings out of your ears, off your wives, your sons, and your daughters. So piercings is not a news thing for children. So take the, that's what it says. Take the earrings out of your wives, take it out of your sons, take them out of your daughters, and bring them to me. And all the people took the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. Then Aaron took the gold, melted it down, and molded it into the shape of a calf. I want you to remember that because later when Moses confronts him, that's not what he says happened. Aaron had some bad mistakes and lies that came out of his mouth. He says, I, he took it and he fashioned it and he made it a calf. And when the people saw it, they exclaimed. Now, I don't know what you would exclaim, but... I go to the donut shop, and they got a little Buddha thing up there, and they got some incense in front of it, and you know, and it's not just there. You can go to haircut salon or wherever, and and these folks that are coming here or have adopted other religions other than Christ, they didn't just come here. Some of them just learning it, and uh, and they got their little idol set up, and they got their little incense burning. Sometimes I walk in and I want to go get out of here. I, it always makes me want to say, what has Buddha done for you? Right? I always want to say, what has, what has Allah done for you? I've seen your country, and I've seen our country. I think our God's treating us a little bit better than your God's treating you. But he says, he says Aaron, Aaron saw how excited the people were. And uh, 
Well, at first he exclaimed, he says, I molded this into the shape of a calf. And when the people saw it, they exclaimed, Oh, Israel, these are the gods who brought you out of the land of Egypt. No, it was just one God, the God, Jehovah God, that brought them out of Egypt. It wasn't a bunch of gods. And uh, Aaron saw how excited the people were. God helped me as a pastor to never just do something because y'all get excited about it. I, <laughs> I could bring Taylor Swift in here, and I'm going to tell you something. They would park cars up and down this. Are y'all with me? People would park their cars up and down this toll. They would shut the toll road down with people stopping to come in here to see a half-dressed, Deceived girl prissing around on my stage up here. Come on. And and people would be excited. <laughs> well, we, you know, as a pastor, we can't just do things just because it makes y'all feel good. <laughs> well, I'm getting a lot of affirmation this morning, but it's okay. I'll get out of the boat by myself. <clears throat> and so the people got up early the next morning. Now, now listen, he, he saw how excited they were, so then he built an altar in front of this stupidity. The Bible says he built an altar in front of the calf that he just made out of the earrings that came out of their ears. I'd like to explain to you all that God does not live in earrings. And they got up next, early the next morning to, to, to bring sacrifices and burnt offerings and peace offerings. After this, they celebrated with feasting and drinking, and they indulged in pagan revelry. In other words, you can read all the translations you want, but I'm going to tell you the paraphrase of it is, they threw a, they threw a sensual, which turned sexual, immorally sexual, party. That's what they did. And it got, it, it, let's just put it like it, it got stupid. It's the stupidest party ever for the wrong reasons. <clears throat> now, now Moses, it's time. God says, it's time for you to get down off the mountain. <laughs> Everybody downstairs should have got real worried. Because the guy that they just called fellow, ain't nothing changed between him and God. He is still the man of God. He don't need millions of people to be a man of God. He don't need results to be a man of God. He is walking in a true relationship with Jehovah Jireh. And he trusts God with all his heart and soul and strength. And he obeys God. And God said, it's time for you to go back down. Now, Moses probably just thinks, it's time for me to just come down here and bring them the word of God that I just got. He's probably excited about this call to come back downstairs. But about halfway down, he picks up Joshua. Joshua's excited to see him. They walk a little ways, and Joshua says, I hear the sound of celebration. Moses says, nope, we're not hearing what you think you're hearing. This is what he said. I'm trying to find it here because I didn't mark it. And so the Lord had told him, he says, this is what the Lord says. He said, these people have turned away from me very quickly, and they've melted down gold, and they've made a calf. And they've bowed down before it, and they've sacrificed to it. And they're saying, these are our gods, O Israel, who brought you out of Egypt. Then the Lord said, I've seen how stubborn and rebellious these people are, and I've got a fierce anger against them. But Moses, 
This is what a true pastor does when he finds out that y'all have committed, when his people, let me say it that way, not y'all, when his people have committed sins, he immediately calls out for the mercy and grace of God because you're a shepherd. And nobody wants to see the sheep suffer. And uh, and so the Lord changed his mind, it says, verse 14. Because Moses said, God, please be merciful and don't judge them. And the Lord changed his mind about this terrible disaster he had threatened to bring on his people. Now, verse 17, when Joshua heard the boisterous noise of the people shouting below them, he exclaimed to Moses, it sounds like war in the camp. But Moses replied, no, it's not a shout of victory, nor is it the wailing of defeat. I, I, I hear the sound of a celebration. I just got a few notes here that I want to share with you out of this story. One, it's amazing how men will worship their own idea. They just get an idea of what God should be, and they'll worship it. Joseph Smith, and, you know, I'm not just talking off the top of my head. I, I, I did some extensive service, uh, research in the past on other religions. I taught classes on it, and... Uh, and I'm going to just tell you, uh, they, they have a lot in common, other religions that are not Christ-based. And it usually comes from a man's idea of how to do things. It's amazing how Joseph Smith's revelation has a lot in, in um, it, it agrees a lot with the Islamic faith, its beginnings. Muhammad said he went to a cave outside of Mecca and was visited by the angel of light. The Bible tells us who the angel of light is. I'm not making this up. I'm telling you exactly. I've read a lot of the Quran myself. If you haven't, you ought to read it, and you'll, you'll, you'll get some real enlightenment about what Islam is all about. And, um, uh, you know, when Muhammad said, this was his own words, I went to a cave, and I was visited by the angel of light. That's his own words. Jesus comes along and tells us the angel of light is Satan. He makes himself like an angel of light. And, and, and then uh, Joseph Smith says he, he had the same thing happen to him. An angel of light came to him, and he had a dream, and blah, blah, blah. And then you get the Mormon faith, not Christ-based, not Christ-centered. And it's just amazing to me how men will worship their own idea of what God is. It really comes down to this. Religion makes a God. Relationship seeks after God. And it happens in the Christian church. I've been in a lot of religious so-called Pentecostal full gospel churches, and you couldn't get a thing done, you couldn't move anything forward unless you fell into the form and formality of somebody's idea of what God does and how he does it. You try to do one thing unorthodox, whoo! I remember when the Brownsville Revival uh, happened, and there was a man who was noted, and he, he, and I'm not gossiping, this is what he said later, he went, he had pastored a church uh, that, that I won't name it, but he had pastored a church for many, many years, and uh, was supposed to be a full gospel Pentecostal church, and uh, went to Brownsville, and this was his exact words, he was asked to speak at a minister's meeting, because our leader wanted us to hear this. He said, I went to Brownsville, and I got saved. That's what the pastor said. Been pastoring for 30 some odd years. Retired a few years later. But when he brought his experience back to the church that he had pastored to be religious for 30 some odd years and tried to drop it on them, it exploded. That church fell apart. He asked me to come there and preach on a revival night. And y'all want to know where the word, the, this is, that was the revival 
my wife can tell you this, Rachel will tell you, David will tell you, that revival was where the name of this church came from. Because I remember getting ready for that service. I was going to preach a Friday night revival thing at their church and a packed house. And, uh, and I preached on the real thing. <laughs> and the pastor told me while I was preaching, he said, I literally thought I was going to pass out. He said, you have no idea what's been going on in my church since I came back from Brownsville. But he said, Brother David, I moved the organ just to reposition some things, and I lost, you, I can't even tell you how many people we lost over that, and it's been going downhill since, because, here's why, because that church was religious, and they were not in relationship with God. Just look it up in your Bible. Go to the book of Charles, Chapter 7, verse 7, and you'll see. Never, ever reposition the organ in your church. <laughs> it's one of the 7,000 religious commandments that men make up. It's right next to never, ever change how you receive the offering. <laughs> Just read your Bible. This stuff is not in there. It's, it's man's religious stuff. And so, relationship seeks after God. Religion makes its own God. Make him what we want him to be. Pastor, can you make a new rule? Yes, it's okay for you to cheat on your wife. You think that's crazy? I can tell you a story of a pastor who said those very same words after cheating on his wife and almost destroy well literally yes destroying a church that today it's taken uh it's been probably 15 years for that church now to to become a stable church again i'm talking i'm not talking about a little church either this was the biggest church in that county 400 people in that church in a small southwest texas town and 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 when he was called on the carpet for committing adultery, this was his reply to his board. Oh, I don't know why y'all are so upset. Every man has at least one or two affairs during his marriage. And one of the board members said, Pastor, are, are you listening to what you're saying? He goes, look, this ain't nothing new. My pastor had affairs, and now I've had one. It ain't no big deal. We'll get over it. And they said, yeah, you'll get over it in another church. Hit the road, Jack. That's what happens when you get into religion. You just make up your own rules. But in relationship with God, you follow after and seek after and run hard after God. I'm not going after another church thing. I'm not going after another religious ceremony. I'm going after God. I want God in my life. I want, I want to know God. I want to spend eternity with God. And so while Moses was seeking, look at this, the people were making. Moses was seeking after God, and they were trying to make God be what they wanted him to be. See, man-made gods, you need to know this about them, they will take from you. He said, give me your golden rings. God says, come give me your life, and I will give you abundant life. Man-made gods always say, give me something. There's got to be a thing. You've got to do something. You've got to say seven of these things. You've got to walk this way. You've got to cut your hair a certain way. You've got to walk a certain way. You've got to talk a certain way. You gotta, there's got to be all these rules, and, they, and religion takes the Ten Commandments, which, by the way, are not suggestions. But the Ten Commandments, whether you know this or not, look at me. The Ten Commandments are not rooted in judgment. They're rooted in love. Why would God say, thou shalt not commit adultery? Because he wants to judge you. God just wants to beat you over the hammer for having fun. No, God wants you to have the best 
possible relationship you can have with your spouse. It should be the best relationship you have outside of your relationship with God. And the best way to destroy it is to cheat on that relationship. And the list goes on and on. All of the commandments are rooted in love, not judgment. But a man-made God takes something from you. I've heard of churches that say every month, I've had somebody tell me, say, well, every month our church sends out a bill. I said, sends out a bill for what? For our tithes. The church sends you a bill? Yeah, our pastor explains it very clearly. It's just like getting your light bill, except it's the church bill. What? Oh, that's Charles chapter 7, <laughs> verse 9. Always make the people pay their bills. We don't do that. Not in the church. Not the church. The church doesn't do that. Man-made religions do that. Man-made gods always take from you. Islam teaches its people, if your good outweighs your bad, at the end of the thing, God puts it on the scale. They say there's this great scale in heaven, and he puts your good deeds over here and your bad deeds over there. And if your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds, then you're in. And oh, by the way, if you've been such a horrible person all your life, and you're afraid that your bad deeds outweigh your good deeds, this is what the Quran says. I'm telling you what it says. I read this for my own self to verify it. The, the Quran says, then the greatest thing you can do is to martyr yourself for Islam, and that will wipe away all your bad stuff. Now, do you want to know why those guys were so willing to jump in an airplane and fly into a building, or they're willing to walk into a crowd and blow themselves up to kill just a few Christians? Because they believe that that one last thing they do will be enough to cleanse all their badness. Man-made gods always take from you. And by the way, that last decision takes away their everlasting possibility of life. But that's what man-made gods do. Man-made gods are fashioned and tooled. The Bible says that Aaron fashioned and tooled this calf out of the golden earrings that they melted down. He then fashioned them and made them into a god. Can I tell you this morning that God is not fashionable? And there is no tool that can change him. Hebrews 13 and 8 says, uh, I better put my glasses on, verify that. Yes, 13 and 8. Jesus Christ, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. You can't change God. We don't, we pastors don't get to, you know, I know, I know we do it. I know, I know it happens, but I got to tell you, according to the scripture, we do not get the, uh, the, we do not have the authority to change one thing about God. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Look, if it worked in, in, in AD 70, it will work in 2023 because God made himself in such a way that he will always work, his plan always work, his word is always right, he's always the last authority on it. And the last thing we need is another preacher in a pulpit somewhere telling us how God ought to be. Let me tell you about woke. God's been woke forever. About everything. If that means you know, let me tell you, God knows. And when God made this thing called the planet and he put people on it, God says, hmm, I'm good enough and I'm, I'm perfect enough to make a system that will work forever. And the only thing he knew that would bring a problem in this system was sin. And I've heard people say, well, then why did God give that opportunity for sin to ever come into the world? Because God wants you to be free in a relationship to love him. That's why. And he says, I'll give you the choice. You can either choose to follow after me and seek me, or you can try to figure out this on your own and just see how bad your plans are going to work. Yeah. 
He knows everything. And nowhere in God's system did he give some deviations, some gray areas that we can waller around in all our life and never figure it out. Wrong. It's all been figured out by God, and his plan is perfect, and it always worked. One man marries one woman. They come together, and they become two. The two become one flesh in Christ, and God blesses them, and they produce children, and we call that family. Hallelujah. And you can, be, you can be whatever you want to be, and you can do however you want to do. I got a text the other night. We did. We got a, pic, a video or whatever, a text from one of my sister-in-laws who's watching right now. Good morning, Madonna. And she sent us this thing, and it's, it, it, it is laughable, but it's not. And it's about how that biologists now, just this last week, have been able to create chicken meat. They did it in a Petri dish. How excited are y'all getting about lunch now? You better read the label of what you're eating. You better learn how to read labels. Thank you, Peter, for teaching me. <laughs> Man, that's a bad thing when you get a Christian from California. They're like, they got the insight, but they got the Holy Ghost, you know. <laughs> Peter's like, Pastor, are you fixing to drink that? And I'm like, yeah. He's like, have you read it? No. And then you read it and you feel convicted on the job. Like, oh, you think I'm bad, Bob. It's bad, man. It's like, dude. Say, and so now I've, I've learned, I say, Peter, what would you like to eat for lunch? <laughs> and I say, where would you like to eat for lunch? Sometimes he says, I don't know, Pastor, it's all so bad. I don't, you know, I don't know what we should eat. <laughs> you could be like Mark when he worked with me. Mark would bring stuff to work and say, uh, <clears throat> you know, Mark, super sweet. He goes, he'll go. Hey, I brought you something today. And it's always like, I read it and I go, well, there's no chemicals in it. <laughs> well, my wife bought it. And I want you to try this. And then you eat it. And it doesn't matter whether it's a protein bar or a drink or even a sandwich. They all taste like alfalfa. It's just, <laughs> just, it's just, thank you, Tracy. <laughs> right? Right. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And they made a, they, they, that article, I don't, I don't remember all, all the details, I don't need to know, but, but somehow they have taken some cells out of chicken and put some who knows what with it and put it in a Petri dish and, have, and produced chicken meat. That's been their goal for years now. They don't want you eating livestock. Read it. Read about it. You'll, you'll figure it out. It's crazy. But God said, nope, I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. I always tell Carol when it gets down, we get to really talking about food, I always say, look, look, I'm not, no, I'm not trying to be a smart aleck because I sure have failed in the area of eating right. Ain't no doubt about that. But I said, look, if y'all are going to start talking about me about diets and all that, then all we got to do is go to the Bible because the Bible says it will teach us everything we need to know about life and godliness. And if you want to learn how to eat right, go to your Bible. And nowhere in the Bible does it say that I need to have a big old fat ball to roll around on in my living room. All we know about that is what Paul said. He said, eh, you can exercise a little. It might do you a little bit of good. But what the Bible says is, is what we should and shouldn't eat. It's, it's in there. Read it. So if y'all going to go eat fried catfish today, you probably haven't been reading your Bible. I'm not saying I don't eat it because Jesus said, if I made it, you can eat it. Okay. So that, I, I've told Carol, if you want to simplify a real diet, here it is. If it's made by God, you can eat it. If it was made by man, not so much. No, Fritos were not made by God. <laughs> Neither was Dr. Pepper, although it feels great. It's, it's not made by God. <laughs> I, I got to finish this. I, I'll never finish it, but it's going to take a month, two months. But let me get these in real quick. Revelry is not the same as rejoicing. See, there is a distinctive 
difference between the sound of celebration and the sound of deliverance and victory. I've been in a church. My wife will tell you this. I went, we went to a camp meeting one night. We went way out in East Texas where, you know, where God really moves. And according to the Pentecostals, that's where God really moves. And so we went way out into deep East Texas to this well-renowned camp meeting, which I will not name. The speaker was world-renowned that night. He did not get to speak that night because the people who were in charge of the meeting that were from that local church, I'll just tell you like it was, they got crazy. It was the craziest night in church of my life. And I made the stupid mistake of sitting on the front row because Carol and I always sit on the front row. Read your Bible and you'll know why. But anyway, no, I'm making that up. That's my rule. I just don't want to see anybody in front of me when I'm worshiping. I always want to be up front. I don't want to watch y'all pick your nose. And so, so we always sit on front and we made a mistake. Packed house. Literally, I mean, we were shoulder to shoulder with people. It was that tight, and they had real pews. You know, we were just scrunched up in that place, and, and the song service started, and there was a guy next to me. I already thought he was a little out there just by the greeting I got from him, and I thought, eh, this guy seems a little weird spiritually to me, you know, and um, just, 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 just didn't feel kosher. And as soon as the music started, man, this guy got crazy like crazy crazy and he was i won't say it i won't say he was dancing that would be an insult to anybody who knows how to dance he was doing something and he would if you ask him he would say he was in the spirit let me tell you something god will never have you do anything in the spirit that is offensive and repulsive to people around you that are christians because people always like to say, well, David repulsed Micah. Yeah, well, Micah wasn't a Christian. She despised what God was doing. Everyone else in the crowd said, look at our, our, our leader. He's humbled himself and he's praising God. This guy got plumb stupid. And I put up with it. He was jumping around. He stepped on my feet. And then I got, I, I, I got my, put my hand up. And every time he'd bounce in, well, while he was in the air, I'd push him away a little bit. And he'd bounce back. And I, I dealt with that as long as I could until he almost knocked my little wife down. And then I was like, okay, this has gotten way past stupid. It's offensive. And I basically just physically pushed that guy away from us and that night the whole place the i realized where he learned how to be stupid he learned how to be a, be stupid from his pastor who literally took the service over that night and had brought this this man of god world renowned to come down there and preach pushed him to the side didn't even let him come with his word from the lord because they needed to celebrate oh i'm preaching they never have had me preach at that camp meeting, though. If they ever do, I'm going to preach the same message I preached back 20 years ago on the real thing. Come on. Because you get in the spirit, man. It's not sensual. It's not stupid. It's not weird. Everybody knows it's God, but people that that step into that realm, they do it because they have a sense of victory in their soul. God brought me up out of a miry clay. You want to get me dancing? I don't need David to play some jazz beat. It might help my rhythm a little bit, but I don't need the music. I just need to remember that God brought me out of a horrible pit. Hallelujah. Or God has given me a great victory. We just saw something that we, we, we didn't know could even happen until we talked to God about it. And God gives us a great victory. There ought to be a little victory shout and a little victory dancing going on. But I'll tell you one thing. You ever stand up in this church, walk down the aisle in your little rhythm and grab my wife and pick her up and want to dance with her, we're going to have a problem. Mark will throw you out of this church. <laughs> Don't underestimate his quietness for weakness. You say, is that real? Oh, it's real. Last church I was in, I don't even mind telling you, Pastor Maddox was in the pulpit one day, and we saw something going, and Pastor walked over to me on the stage while he was preaching. He said, Brother Krausen, go out there and remove that man from the service. I said, yes, sir. 
I'm from Channel View. We know how to do it. <laughs> Come on now. I watched my pastor do it when I was growing up. You get stupid, we can deal with stupid. <laughs> but boy, when it's real, yeah. we'll rejoice with you. Yeah. We will shout with you. But you ever misinterpret scripture and start jerking clothes off in here like they did on this day? Mark will remove you from this building with a, gla with a towel around you. There is a distinctive difference between religious garbage and true worship. Look, man-made gods always bring the judgment of God on their servants because man-made gods have servants. People serve pornography, they serve uh, alcohol, they serve uh, partying, they, they, reveling, that kind of lifestyle. They serve drugs. Uh, they serve uh, the, the pains and the hurts of their past. It controls them. It becomes their little God. And everywhere they go, they're a victim and they need everybody to help them get through it. I want to be compassionate but I'm not gonna do it with you for 20 years. I'm gonna give you some remedies, and you tell me you've been hurt, I'm here to help you, and I'll take the healing balm of Gilead by the Spirit and put it on your wounds of the past, but my Bible says in that moment, you will be healed, and you get over it. I will not, I will not spend 20 years with you moaning and groaning about your problems. I will listen, because that's what pastors do. but I am not going to sit back and waller in it with you. Because man-made gods, what they do is they bring the judgment of God on their servants. They keep you in a sinful place and, and keep you away from the true God, and that brings judgment on you. But look at this. Forgiveness and restoration are available only through the one true God. Look, I've read the Quran. It never offers forgiveness and restoration. It, offer, it offers you an opportunity to do better so you can overcome your bad. It never forgives you of your sins. Come on. God will forgive you of your sins. And he says, I'll cast them from you as far as the east is from the west, and I won't ever remember them against you again. You don't have to come to heaven and go, well, God, here's the bad stuff. Weigh that. All the donuts over here, broccoli and Brussels sprouts over there. Oops. <laughs> uh-uh. And here's the deal. Why do I need forgiveness? Because sin produces plagues. The last part of this story here is they were smote with plagues. I'm showing you this because you're going to see a trend throughout your Bible over the next few weeks. When a nation turns against God and it sins against God in a rebellious state, it always produces plagues. Where did COVID come from? Well, the Chinese did it in that same Petri dish they're building chicken in right now. Some say Donald Trump brought it on us. Some, some say Nancy Pelosi brought it on us because, you know, and some say that, uh, what's the other dude's name? Uh, John Kerry. His family did it because they own the Heinz Corporation and they're involved. And some people say Bill Gates did it. L let me tell you who did it. We did it. Where it comes from doesn't matter. It was a plague, and it's still among us today. People still dealing with COVID, and it's a plague. And it came because of sin. Sin always produces plagues. They should have known that. They saw God play it out for them in Egypt when they got out of Egypt. They should have remembered. Let me, let me end this today. Exodus thirty three sixteen out of the New Living Translation says this, how will anyone know that you look favorably on me? This is Moses talking. On me and on your people if you don't go with us. For your presence among us sets your people and me apart 
from all other people on the earth. God's presence sets us apart from the world. That is the big difference. That, my friends, is the big difference between religion and relationship. You can, you, I heard someone ask, I heard a reporter ask Joe Biden, I don't know when it was, I just saw it, but I don't know that it happened this week because they didn't give a date and I don't know for sure when it happened, but I saw the video of the reporter looking right at Biden and, and he was talking about uh, abortion and homosexuality and he says to him, but I understand you're a Catholic. He said, the Catholic Church teaches that abortion is wrong and the homosexuality is a sin, and yet you're for it. And his answer was, well, the church is coming around. Something like that. Not those exact words, but that's kind of what he meant. The church is going to come around to my way of thinking. In other words, we're going to tool our God. We're going to fashion our God. Our God's not fashionable. He just says, I am what I am. What will I say, Moses? Moses says, what will I say, God? What will I say, God? I am that I am sent you. That's who sent you. The I am that I am sent you. That's what you tell them. I am. I am what I am. I am who I am. I do what I do. I require what I require, and that is for people to seek me with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength. And when you do that, you won't look around and say, well, I am blessed or I'm not blessed. That ain't going to make a difference. A plague breaks out, ain't going to change one thing because you are not in religion. You are in relationship with the Most High God. Hallelujah. Stand with me. I got to quit this morning. Hallelujah. 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 Father, I believe that this series of messages is going to begin today with a new heart in your people at Real Church. And God, you are giving us today, I believe that you are about to give us a heart of repentance. And we are going to learn how to live in the way of repentance. Where our heart is grieved with what your heart is grieved by. Where we have a distaste for the things of the world. And we get so hungry and thirsty after you that anything that tries to come into our life and rob us of you, we will spit it out and run it away from us. Hallelujah. Let the spirit of repentance rest upon this people. We have declared that our church is, uh, is a revival church. We believe it. We are looking for the outpouring of the Holy Ghost in our church. And God, I know that there is no outpouring of the Holy Ghost. There is no spiritual renewal. There is no revival. There is no restoration. There is no reformation without repentance. So let the spirit of repentance rest upon us. And we ask you today to move upon us with that spirit in the name of Jesus. I had a vision years ago. I heard, you always wonder, do you have a vision or a dream or whatever? And you wonder, was it, was it God? How did it happen? Was it really me? Was it, was it God? What was it? And I listened to Perry Stone this week. He really brought some clarity to the whole thing about dreams and visions. And so I, I, I've had several visions over the years. Most of the time, it was it, it's when I'm in the carpet praying. You know, you're down on your face and you're praying, and God will let you see some things like, like He's putting something together in your heart, but you see it like a movie. And so I was getting ready to preach a message, and um, it, it was it was a it was a message of you know sin and repentance and that kind of thing. And um, I was I was trying to to make the illustration of what it is to walk in the world of sin, to be in the world. The scripture I was using was, we are to be in the world, but not of the world. And so I was trying to illustrate that. And the Lord gave me a vision. And in the vision, I was dressed like my grandpa used to dress on Sunday morning when he's going to preach. That's back when if you're an evangelist, you had to wear white. So my grandpa took that to extreme. He had white, shiny, patent leather shoes, white socks, white suit, white shirt, white tie, and he was white-haired. 
And I mean, he took the pulpit, man, he made, he made uh, Benny Hinn look dirty, if you know what I mean. I mean, he was clean, clean. His idea was of the white was you come to the pulpit clean. And in the vision, I saw myself and I was dressed like that. I wasn't walking into the church. I was walking into a coal mine. And this is what I did in the vision. I just walked, you know, it, it's a cave. You understand coal mine, it's a cave. I didn't touch anything. I didn't touch anything. I walked in the middle of it and I walked in and I just looked around and in the vision, I just walked out. That's it. I didn't, it was dark. Everything, it was cold. The walls were cold, it was black. And it was dark. There were no lights on in there. Didn't see anything. And I walked out. And I was a little confused. And I looked down. And my beautiful white attire had black dust all over it. Just by, are y'all with me? Just by walking in that atmosphere, it got on me. And the Lord told me that morning, and I preached this to a church somewhere in a revival. The Lord said, you need to tell my people there's sin that gets on you just because you're in the world. And you got to learn to identify that. It's not always what you do. It's what you see. It's what you hear. It's who you're around. And it tends to get on you. And, and the Lord said, but, but I can clean you. And I can wash you and you can be white again. Come on. I wore a new shirt to work. So I had to go do a little job this week for a friend of mine. I went over there and I, I, I was very careful because it's a little bitty job. It ain't gonna take me a few minutes. I, well, it was a few hours, but I went over there and I, and, I, and I did all of it. And then he said, oh, there's one more thing. Well, I was just installing some new fans. It was easy. Just mounted them, hooked them up, bam. But they were just out of the box and brand new clean. He said, but I want you to take this one off the wall over here and move it. Okay, no problem. Three screws. I go up, bzz, bzz, unplug it, take the wires loose. Bzz, bzz, and that thing fell on me. It was in a machine shop. Oh my Lord. When that fan fell in my arms, I literally destroyed that new shirt in a second. It had black, greasy dust all over that shirt. I tried to get it off. It just made it worse. I brought it home. You know what I did? I went to my wife and I said, hey, I, I, I hate to throw this shirt away, but I pretty much destroyed it. I just bought it. I know it's not a lot of money, but can you see? All you women know what I'm talking about. She got the spot remover and you get the brush out and you get the spot remover out or the bleach or whatever you got and you put it on there or if you go to the internet you get the dawn soap out because it does everything cures chickens i mean it does lots of stuff and and you put it on there and you scrub it in and you leave it in and you put it in the washing machine put the regular soap in there all that stuff and run it through the heavy cycle are y'all with me and when it's done the thing comes out looking new again that's what god wants to do in his church because when we are clean we are powerful and we don't have anything holding us back so today father i'm praying that you will clean us up that is not my job i realize that this is not my job to clean people's lives up i've had people try to get me to do it lord They'll come and tell me, so-and-so did this. You need to go talk to them. And I'm always reminded, I am not the Mr. Clean. I'm not out here trying to clean people up. I'm just trying to lead people to Jesus. The cleaning is your business. And we trust you today. I trust you with me to clean me up. And I trust you with our people today, God, to clean them up because we want to be a powerful church. We want testimonies to flow out of our church on a weekly basis. We want to know that what we prayed about last week, we saw it happen this week. Hallelujah. We want to tell testimonies that our God is with us. He is present with us. And the world will know you're with us because they will see the miracles that take place in our church. 
So if you feel like I feel this morning, I want you to lift your hands to heaven. I'm not even going to call you forward today. I'm not singling anybody out. This message is to the church. I want you to lift your hands to heaven. And I want you to begin to ask God, clean me today. We Clean me today, Lord. Just as, as the psalmist prayed in Psalm 51, Lord, clean us today. Create in us a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within us, O God. Cleanse us from the evil sins, the iniquity that gets in us, Lord. Recognize our re We recognize our rebellion. And we know it was against you and you alone that we've sinned. We've done what is evil in your sight. You, you will be proved right in what you say. And I, I, he said, the psalmist said, I was born a sinner. And, and from the moment my mother conceived me, I was in sin. But you desire honesty from the womb, teaching me wisdom every day. Hallelujah. Purify me from my sins and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Hallelujah. Give me back the joy again of my salvation. You have broken me. Now let me rejoice in purity. Hallelujah. Don't don't see my sins. Wash them away. Remove the stain of my guilt. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Renew a right spirit within me. And please, Lord, do not cast me out of your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Holy Spirit, dwell with us. Speak with us today. Don't let it end at the end of this service, but walk with us this week. And when sin tries to get on us, may you be the shield about us to keep us from sin. Hallelujah. Keep our garments white so we'll be ready when the day comes. Restore unto us the joy of our salvation. Make us a willing, obedient servant. Hallelujah. Teach us your ways, oh God. Teach us your ways. Teach us how to return to you. Hallelujah. And for Forgive us, forgive us for all our wrongs. Loose our lips to praise you properly. Whew. May our broken spirit and a contrite heart be what you see. A repentant heart, O oh God. And please, God, look with favor upon us. Rebuild our walls. <laughs> Restore our sacrifices and our burnt offerings. And rebuild our altars, God. Help us to rebuild the altars. Can you thank the Lord for speaking to you? I know he's speaking to you. So, just so you'll know, Y'all know Carol and I do not take frequent vacations. We usually take one maybe every year, sometimes not every year. Sometimes we might take two, a small one and another one. Um, when Pastor Greg was with us back in January and he gave us this gift, it came with a prophetic word. And he said, I believe that when you go to Cancun and y'all have this, now we're not going to... Uh, we're going to a place he and his wife have been to. It's kind of more of a sabbatical type place than some of the other places that you can go. And um, he said, if, you, if you're if you like me, you're going to love it because you're going to have lots of quiet time in, in, in a beautiful place. Um, it's not a party resort per se. And he said, what's going to happen when you're there is he said, God is going to begin to reveal to you the plans for your future building. So... I've been praying about that ever since. And because how many of y'all know, your pastor ain't just going to receive every word everybody gives him. You better pray for a pastor like that. Just because somebody stands in this pulpit and I let them have it doesn't mean I'm going to take everything they say. I'll do that everywhere I go. You, you should do that. You should never just take things because people say them. That's good preaching, Pastor Krause, and Amen. But I love Greg and I respect him and I took the word and I received it and I said I'm gonna ponder this in my heart like Mary and I've had many months now to pray about it and the Lord has begun to show me some details about our future building and all of that and I just want to tell you that last Sunday we were praying and um, we, well, I don't know what we were doing in the service I may have even been preaching when I, I don't know but it was some moment maybe when we were worshiping 
the Lord spoke to my heart, said the first thing I want you to do when you step into your next building, and I'm, I'm talking about when we possess the next building, I don't know what that building is, but when we possess the next building, we're gonna do something we have not done in the first two, and you can, I'll ask you to forgive me for it, but the next building we have, the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna restore altars in our church. Because there needs to be a place of sacrifice. Now, I'm not telling you we're going to cut up calves because y'all don't have any. So, you understand sacrifice in the New Testament? It hasn't been done away with. It was fulfilled. The sacrifice, look at the sacrifice for sin was fulfilled in Christ. The idea of sacrifice has not been done away with. That, that's, that's foolishness to think that to misinterpret Jesus ministry by saying he did away with the Old Testament it never says that the New Testament says he fulfilled the law every jot and tittle he fulfilled the sacrifice he fulfilled those things that you do as a Christian come to church pray pray for people witness to people share the gospel Jesus did all those things he was our example so I know why we removed the altars from the church years ago because they may have become somewhat religious but i want to tell you we need an altar back in our lot we need an altar back in the church and if i can never drag y'all to it at least it will be a simple that in front of my church that we believe there's a place you can come and the holy spirit can change your life in a moment on your knees at an altar And if it's too uncomfortable for you, we'll just have, you know, most churches have these little bowls in the, in the foyer now with the earplugs in it. We're going to have bowls with knee pads. Just kidding. I want your knees to be scarred. I want you to come down and kneel at an altar and pray. And uh, I know we kneel at the steps, but we need an altar. And uh, that's good preaching, Pastor Carlson. We are not going to be like every other church. I don't care if they've all taken them out. I... I, I, I know we needed the room, but we we need and we need altars. And so, um, and now I'm asking now I'm asking the Lord to show me what they ought to look like, Bob, because I don't want to just. I'm not saying we won't. I don't know what God will say. I'm just saying at this point, I don't want it just to be another thing. I don't want just another thing. I want what God wants. And if He wants that altar to look a certain way, that's the way it's going to be. And everybody else just get over it. So I only got to make two people happy here. First, I got to make God happy. Then I got to make her happy. And then I got to make me happy. The rest of y'all, I'm not worried about. Y'all don't have to be happy. I just need to lead y'all into being right. Come on. Amen. All right. Please pray for us Tuesday at 1.30 is our meeting. And um, at, pray for wisdom. Pray for our faith. Pray for favor. We need favor. We need favor. And uh, uh, I believe... And you might even add to that as you pray. God, pray it this way. God, if you don't want my pastor to lead us through this door, will you slam it shut and lock it so tight that he can't pry it open? That's a good specific prayer. And then you can say it. This, the reverse of that is, Father, if this is your will for real church, this is what you want us to do, then you give our pastor favor. And would you open that door so smoothly that he doesn't have to pry it open? And God can do that. Amen. I love you. I love you so much. I want, I want, I want us to spend eternity together in heaven. And uh, if we'll live with a repentant heart and we'll follow after Jesus, that's all you need. That's all you need to get into heaven. Amen. Father, I lift my hand over your people today to bless them. The word of God says that if we would hearken to your voice and obey and do all your commandments, that all these blessings would come upon us. You would bless us in our bodies, in our spirits, on our jobs, in our businesses and careers. When we work, when we play, when we come in the door, we go out the door from the north, the south, the east, and the west. We would be overtaken by the blessings of the Lord. And you went so far as to say you, you would bless everything that we put our hands to if we would hearken to your voice 
and obey and do your commandments. I speak and declare today that as we, your people, hearken to your voice and obey and do your commandments, we are a blessed people in the name of Jesus. God bless you. Amen. Have a great day and a great week in the Lord.